G'day fans and welcome to an absolutely miserable uh, rip it off the card this week. I mean, we'll show, we showed in the intro sequence there that the inside of Aaron's store, but no one can go to Aaron's store at the moment because of this epic lockdown. Last week it was just Victoria. Victoria was free and New South Wales was all locked down. Now the whole country is going to the shit house. Uh, what would you be doing except sitting at home uh, watching us? Except for Aaron, of course, who's actually in his store, sitting there all alone, uh, just twiddling his dirglies. How are you going, old son? I tell you what, I'm I'm already over this lockdown, and we've only been been in it for less than a week, haven't we? So, oh, geez, I tell you what, it's an absolute pain in the ass, a big time. Now, I've got to ask you uh, off the top of your head because, uh, like last year, the store hadn't really opened when lockdowns sort of were kicking in, but this time it's hit you guys pretty hard. So, how are you guys coping now that the fact the store's been shut for a week? Dogs and cats living together. Uh, <laughs> we're about, you know, we're, we're about 80% down because we're just doing our online sales, but we still can do click and collect and we still have the shop. And the, the plus of the thing is when we're not in lockdown, about 30 people check out our online store a day. Now about 100 people are checking out the store a day. So there you go. Very, very good. I love it. Joel has already sent a message saying he's looking forward to this one. Uh, I hope it's better than last week because for those who are people who are Star Trek fans, our Star Trek show absolutely sucked the big one in terms of getting numbers and replay views. People can't stand classic Star Trek. They've said, nah, stuff it, so we're not going to be covering that ever again. Bring on more no, Star Wars. That. That's always where the money is. Sorry, cut you off, man. What are going to say? No, don't say that. I like classic Star Trek. I'm just the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, very, very cool. We've already got, look, see the list. Everybody's in lockdown, right? We've got 20 people already with us, which is absolutely fantastic because no one, they can't go anywhere. So uh, it's absolutely fantastic. So, uh, but uh, no, captive, thank you for, sorry, sorry, I cut captive, off. What was that? Captive audience, that's just what we need, isn't it? Yeah, as soon as I said that, two people bug it off, so there you go. Um, uh, yes, exactly right. Anyway, it should be a very, very exciting show tonight. People are stuck at home, so we know we're competing against The Bachelor and MasterChef and all these other you know, survivor you're behind, and you're behind. Master Master Chef finished like Survivor started. Oh yeah, I know. I mean, the fact that we're competing against reality TV shows and people prefer to watch them instead of watching the two of us. We're a reality TV show. What can I say? Hey, <laughs> uh, the tribe has spoken. Dags has been voted off the podcast. Uh, very very good. Uh, you're right, Joel. Yeah, yeah. Classic Trek might be the best, but not as far as TV shows are concerned. Because uh, in terms of our uh, replay view numbers last week, it was the worst of our, all of our episodes. So, uh, so if you were uh, if you were a Star Trek fan and you want us to do more Star Trek episodes, share last week's show with some of the group so we get the numbers up absolutely love it and good old greg can't he, after a week off of not having docky who on the show he's hanging out for a bit more of that <laughs> so there you go so carol has said that master chef is finished but the bachelor starts tonight and don't you dare tell me carol you're gonna be watching the bachelor <laughs> <laughs> oh jesus christ all right very very good now uh as always uh we have people who come into the store on a regular basis and uh become writers now of course the store is shut but that didn't stop a writer from appearing uh, last week. And who we've got this week, uh, Mr. Aaron? This week we've got my very good friend, Rod. Um, Rod, who is a writer and, and watches the show and also um, works in the shop on Sundays. So he's like a triple threat, like viewer, worker, friend. And look, he's wearing your T-shirt. And, and on him, it's sort of um, because I got it my, my size, it's kind of... Um, a bit below and lost, but we've, we've got the meet the writers over the top so you can't see it. Rod is a fan of classic toys. Um, often he'll work for toys, which is the best employee of all. Dags, I've got to get him hooked on something, haven't I? <laughs> I love it. You're doing this bit of a bio on Rod. He's like, it's like the he's like his version of the Bachelor, and he's a nice guy, and he collects this, and he likes going out and having candlelit dinners and watching Star Trek. No, he doesn't watch Star Trek on the week. <laughs> Rod's, Rod Rod is taken. Um, Sarah, who also watches, is 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 his partner. But I do think if he wasn't taken, he would be a great example for the Bachelor. Speaking of which, I just read a comment here, and I'm a little bit disgusted, actually. Uh, Gavin has said he's recording The Bachelor. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> because even Carol has said, nah, she's watching us on the big screen, and Glenn, her, her hubby, is watching us for the first time, thinking, when's this lockdown going to end so he doesn't have to put up with us gurgling on like nerds? What can I say? He's probably <laughs> thinking, if he's seeing us, he's probably thinking he's got COVID and got a fever. Uh, what's this on TV? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, exactly right. So, yes, uh, thanks for everybody joining us tonight. I know the lockdown things are pain in the ass. Everybody's stuck at home, got nothing better to do except for watch us. So, uh, hey, unless you're here, uh, what's the best thing we can do except for entertain you? And of course, that's what we're going to do. So, I guess we should probably kick stuff off. And uh, as always, now last week this didn't work. We did some tests before <laughs> we went on air and it worked beautifully. So, will we have some action? Let's have a look and. <laughs> That's bullshit. I'm going to do that again. So, um, yeah. We're a really you, 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 talk, you talk to the crowd for a second while I get this sorted out, all right? We're a real, real, real professional mob here. It works twice when we try it beforehand and then, then live to air. I think, um, have we got it lined up? Yeah. Mate, we, what can I say? Complete professionals. Was it worth it? That's the question you got to ask yourself. And the answer is uh, probably not. So uh, there probably you go. Not. Very, very cool. And we got, look at that. What's this? So who knows what that is? I I'm not sure if anyone will be able to identify it from that. I would be able to because I'm a bit of a horror fan. But um, this is a premium format statue of uh, a creature from one of my favourite movies. It's a Stan Winston creation. It's um, Pumpkinhead or Vengeance the Demon from the, I think it's an 80s movie, late 80s, early 90s, um, uh, horror movie about... Um, a grieving father releasing a demon on a on a bunch of teenagers on dirt bikes. I mean, you can't get much better than that, can you? It's never going to end well for them. What can we say? <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't. Very good. So, now, when I first looked at this picture, I thought, you know what? I've kind of gone out with girls who kind of reminded me of this when they've had a bit too much to drink. <laughs> Well, that's funny because I've gone out with girls that have told me they that I remind them of Vengeance the Demon. So. <laughs> <laughs> and they so, haven't, yeah, been, very, and they haven't been drinking. So. Yeah, exactly right. There's a good couple of good thought bubbles you could put on top of that, couldn't you? Eh? So uh, the, <laughs> you just have the thought bubble of kitty, kitty, kitty. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I thought goodness. it's a good one to highlight because um, it is a classic creature and there's not a lot of um, vengeance, the demon pumpkin head merchandise. And when you say 80s kids on dirt bikes, you almost think BMX bandits. That would have been a much better movie if it had um, vengeance, the demon in it, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And I love the fact that he is a somewhat anatomically correct, uh, but not he doesn't have much to be sort of proud of. But uh, let's move on from that, shall we? Now, you were speaking of creatures earlier, and when you sent me through the pictures of this, I thought, who would come up with this? Look at that. Well, what on this got? show, we're not always showing you like the best and most popular things. It's more the more interesting things that I can't believe they've made sometimes. Now, don't don't let's say that we don't um, cater for, for the girls that are watching as well, and some of the guys probably, but these are Jurassic Park um, shoes. They're quite high heels, and I think what the genius thing about them is they've got amber heels with a mosquito in. So if you were going to uh, maybe impress a a archaeologist or a biologist or a geneticist, this is the pair of shoes you would wear. And to think these shoes are not CG either. And that reminds me, Gavin has said uh, while he's recording The Bachelor, uh, Beam Expanders was on TV last night, so there you go. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah, that, I mean, who would think of this? This is the kind of thing you would have thought of 30 years ago when the movie came out, uh, 30 years and uh, nearly 30 years ago. Not today. I don't know who would want these today, but it's it's they look good, but I just, I just don't get why you would produce them. What do you reckon? Do you, well, do you know how nerdy I am? I'd get a pair of those and I'd be drilling into the heels to see if I could get out dinosaur DNA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, golly, golly, golly. I actually uh, knew a lady one time who used to wear really, really high shoes, like the one on the left here, that with the really, really high heel, um, the, the sole, completely, like, impractical. And we actually asked her, said, how the earth can you walk around in those? She said, honey, all I have to do is just walk from the lounge room to the bedroom and <laughs> let's leave it at that, shall we? So there you go. But anyway, now, this is for Greg. Now, Greg was grizzling earlier because Greg you know, can be a bit of a grizzler sometimes about Docky Who. He wants a bit of Docky Who. So sure enough, Greg, here we are. So the most exciting news for a Doctor Who fan is when a missing episode is returned. And most of the Abominable Snowman, which is the episode we're seeing pictures from, is missing. Unfortunately, it isn't about a missing episode return, though. Um, they have made a set from the Abominable Snowmen. Um, a character character has made a set, and it's an exclusive one that you can only buy online. So it's the second Doctor with his um, coat that hasn't been available ever before and apparently won't ever be available again, and the TARDIS that um, is made to look as it was in that episode. So... Um. 
This is available online now as a character exclusive in the UK. I have ordered a bunch in for the shop and I'm going to sell them at cost. So what it costs me to get them in, I'm selling plus GST because um, they charge us GST. So they're $89 in the shop, which is quite reasonable for something that's an exclusive and coming from overseas. So if anyone's after one and doesn't like ordering stuff online, you can um, contact us at Aaron's Collectibles and I will get you a set. Now, does this mean, there's a whole lot of things I've got to mention here. Uh, does this mean that Greg King is suddenly licking the screen because he can't control himself? Um, regarding the Jurassic Park shoes, uh, I agree, Jared. Uh, yeah, there was a huge mozzie. Yeah, it's going to take, take a few chunks out of you. Um, and uh, Thomas, now, if you want to see Beauty and the Geek, <laughs> when the store is open, <laughs> come in on a Saturday with Aaron and myself, and you can decide which one's the beauty and which one's the geek. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness gracious me. Uh, and there's a message from, from William uh, to you. I won't put it on screen because it's a private message to Aaron, but have a read of that when you get a second. So there you go. Uh, very, very no cool. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, yes, Beauty and the Geek has nothing to do with first dates. Well, if you know your Indiana Jones or your Raiders of the Lost Ark, you will know that about, something about dates. You eat them. Very, very cool. All right, welcome. Anyway, let's move on. More aliens. And this is still um, related to the last post. Um, the character has never, ever produced the Yeti, which goes with that story. On the left, um, Daypole that made Doctor Who back in the 80s got a prototype happening and then they lost the license, so that was never produced. In the middle, character actually got a prototype happening and because the prototype leaked, there was legal issues and it was never produced. So on the right, is someone's made a custom, and I found this on the Doctor Who uh, custom figure Facebook page. Um, if, if they could get, get themselves together and produce that, that would be absolutely fanta fantastic. But that's actually an axon that's been filed down and changed into a Yeti. So that's the closest you're going to get to getting a Yeti at the moment. I just thought I'd put that in there because we're getting the, the Doctor and the TARDIS set. Um, I agree with you, Gavin. Uh, when it comes to go visiting the store on the Saturday, there's no beauty only geek. <laughs> <laughs> Truer words that were never spoken. Who have uh, you been talking to, Gavin? Yeah, yeah, right. The third one does look like a womble, doesn't it? There's a womble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness gracious me. It really, looks really like a womble that's streaking. Uh, yeah, so exactly right. It's um, It doesn't look that threatening when you see it like that, eh? So, uh, yeah, it's exactly right. Um, very, very cool. I'm going to change. I have to change screens because I don't know what the next thing is. Uh, oh, yes, we're talking about collecting now. So uh, where are we? Uh, very, very good. Collector is better than your vision. Very, very cool. All right, let's move on, shall we? So what do we got now? So a couple of weeks ago, you might remember in our last lockdown, we did a show called um, Collecting During Lockdown, where we looked at um, buying things from overseas and the best way to get a good deal and shopping from your home. Now, I wanted to do an update on that because this is um, practicing what I preach. Um, I got a set of Doctor Who books and they're Japanese ones. Um, sorry, Dags, if you go back. Sorry. Right. Yep. Yeah. So you can see on that picture, they were... Uh, 2,500 yen, which was about $30. Um, so anyone who collects Doctor Who will know that is an absolute ripper of a bargain. And I put some eBay auctions down the bottom there and you can see they go from anything, the cheapest was about $230 to about $480 for the for the same thing. And for those who are interested in trying to do this on international sites, uh, I thought it would be good just to show the... Uh, the process. So underneath the picture with the update, um, it cost me 20, uh, 2,500 yen, which was about $31. Underneath is all the different fees you get to get them into Australia. So there was the winning the auction fee, there was the local co postage to the reshipper fee, there was um, the reshipper repacking it fee, and then there was the shipping to me fee, which turned out to be more expensive than the actual items. Um, I think it cost me about $63 postage all up, which sounds a lot, but when you're getting stuff from eBay, the eBay um, the eBay shipping service that they do is often more than that anyway. Anyway, I got them landed for under $100, which is an absolute bargain. So I thought I would just show a couple of weeks after we did the collect collecting and lockdown, you can do it and you can still get a bargain from your living room. Yeah, and the only problem is your postie can't deliver them because they're in lockdown as well. <laughs> <laughs> <Self -isolation. laughs> I'm only joking. Uh, yeah, very, very cool. And the other the other thing collecting during lockdown, I have a little story. Um, when I was growing up, these, these are called dump bin headers, and they are the cardboard headers that they stick in the top of 
cardboard racks at a bookshelf, uh, at a bookshop to advertise what they're selling. Um, when I was little, and this is going back to when I was about seven or eight, I wanted these dump bin headers from the local Collins bookshop. And little Aaron went into that shop every week and it seemed like for about a year, it was probably for about six or eight weeks saying, when you're finished with that, can, can I have it? When you're finished with that, can I have it? And every week they were like, yep, yep, we know you want it. We know you want it. We know you want it. And then I went in one week and it was gone. And I said, did you put it aside to me? And of course they said, no, we threw it out. So, so that would have been about 1981, 1982. And it's only taken me um, 50, oh, 40, 40 years nearly um, to get it. But the crazy thing is I've had one eye open for these for ages to go with my Doctor Who book collection. And there's about six different ones that they produced over the years and you never see any of them. And then within about a week, um, I managed to get all of them. So there you go. Uh, Jared's got a classic, yeah, dumping headers. Yeah, that can be <laughs> misinterpreted in many different ways. So there you go. <laughs> Could have just said they chucked it out. So, uh, yes, yeah, very, very good. Yeah. So these are some of the other ones I picked up. Um, and they were in two different auctions in eBay. One was in the UK and one was uh, local. So crazily, I got them all within about a week of each other, which... Um, oh, how about that? If you're a Docky Who fan like uh, good old Greg uh, King is at the moment, you'd be going, oh, my God, off your nut! And you think, oh, Aaron will display these in the store <laughs> from tomorrow through to Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Anyway. For everyone who wants their Doctor Who um, their Doctor Who content, there that, that was it for the, the evening. <laughs> Very good. Uh, you are right, Gavin. Uh, actually, it's not these days. It's actually quite a lot. Uh, in the, it's one of the hardest things to collect are things that uh, are not available to the public because typically the distributors will actually throw these things out. So uh, it's been going on since the dawn of time. So uh, when yeah. you can get stuff that is not public destined, uh, that's worth grabbing. And, of course, it's worth a bit of money as well. Now, last week we introduced a new, brand new segment. Uh, which we actually a bit of a hit, and I think he's watching here tonight once again. Uh, and, of course, it's to do with one of our uh, most famous um, uh, viewers of this show uh, at the moment, and, of course, it's The Vile. So there we go. Now, just explain for us again, because we've got people who haven't seen this show before. What exactly is The Vile? Vile, Mr. Aaron. Well, Lord Vile presides over all the horrible, rotten toys and items on the internet, and semi-weekly or weekly, um, he'll be trawling through the different items and finding particularly bad examples of stuff that shouldn't have been released um, and presenting it here um, to, to warn us, basically, away from um, buying these items. Now, last week, we're just going to give you a bit of a sample of something, right? So last week... We showed you uh, this, right, which was, if can we put my buttons to work, very good, which was the monster briefs in colour. Now, what I wanted to do is just highlight the fact that, you know, you got the creepy, the eerie and the famous monsters uh, underpants, right? And it was only after the show finished, I said to Aaron, you know what, imagine like you're wearing these and you go into a bar and you pick up the chick, right? Now, you can <laughs> rearrange the genders as much as you want, but from my perspective, right, you pick up the chick, right? You know, and things are going quite well, and you're in the car and all the rest of it. And if she says to you, "Hey, you got a monster in your pants? In your pants? Are you just happy to see me?" You could say, "You damn right, I got a monster in my jacks." <laughs> well, that works. that works unless you're wearing the eerie pair. Yeah, <laughs> it's looking a tad creepy, if you know what I mean. So, uh, <laughs> is that a line in the? <laughs> I've got monsters in my pants. I'm not afraid to use them. <laughs> All right, so tonight we've got this. Let's move on, shall we? So tonight in the Vile File, we have ugly action figures, and boy, there's been a few of them. Um, I thought we were fi we were finished with Doctor Who, but we're not. We've got the first release of Rose Tylo that was Billy Piper, and obviously from the bottom picture, it looks more like Sloth from the Goonies with a wig slapped on. I mean, I don't know how that got through quality control. The second one there, I think a lot of people know because it's a bit legendary. It's become known as the the monkey faced layer. And and when um, Kenner brought back the Star Wars figures in the mid '90s, they released a wave that um, they weren't quite sure where they were pitching the audience, whether it was action for kids or uh, grown up collectors. So. Um, you can obviously see from her pose without her skirt on, she's got like those birthing hips happening as well. So it wasn't yeah, a good... She's uh, been riding too many tauntauns by the looks of it. That's just <laughs> not very flattering at all, is it really? Exactly. Uh, not very flat, flattering at all. But the one that takes the cake there is um, Hermione Granger from Harry Potter, which I don't know, looks like a, a piece of popcorn that's 
that's been painted with an eye, eyes and a nose and a mouth. And again, I don't know how, how some of these get through quality control, but we're grateful that Lord Vile has brought these to our attention and put them in the Vile file so we can definitely avoid any of these in our collections. Exactly right. So as from our perspective, these items have definitely been violated. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Now, you had some other stuff you wanted to show as well. Is that right? Um, I, I, I'd made up a card of different um, items that... Uh, so we've got that slide there of items we might look at at the future. Um, there's some classic ones there. There's, the, of course, the Jar Jar lollipop with the tongue um, and obviously some um, stuff that got through that probably wasn't licensed or they weren't thinking properly when they did it. I like the Wonder Woman and Scissors particularly, but yeah. um, these are many things that will go into the Vile file in weeks we weeks to come. So um, we've got a lot to look forward to. Lord Vile has really been working hard. He has indeed. So very, 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 very cool. And I just got to work out what's coming up next. All right. So we've had a good, some good luck with our videos. Um, so we should be moving into our eBay section. So give me a second. I just got to push a couple of buttons. Uh, I like that one. The bottom layer looks like it was in drag. Yeah, they weren't flat. It's hard to believe that these things are actually manufactured, but they were. And that's just how the way it goes. But anyway, we must move on. Ooh, baby, do you know that's All right. I'm going to fix this. You keep talking. <laughs> So obviously um, we're like sub channel 31 professionalism uh, when it comes to our intros and outros. Um, we do try, we're sorry about this. Here we go. All right, here we go. Was it all worth it? Oh God, how painful is that? So Probably not. Go. Very, very cool. All right, so what are we talking about tonight? Well, tonight, because we're looking at video games, I thought we would look at video games. So we're looking at um, video games uh, that have sold recently on eBay. I love that one. Because we're looking at video games, we're looking at video games, we're going to look at video games. I thought you'd like that. What were you saying about um, professional presentations? I don't know. Um, all right. I've, so I haven't got a teleprompter that... here. This is all on the fly. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so for those who've never seen this before, we're going to show you some items that sold on eBay. You've just got to uh, type in your guesses as to what you think they went for. So let's kick this off, shall we? What do we got? Okay. Um, one of the things that people have been collecting, and it's becoming a bit of a lost format, is old PC games. Now, we've looked and we've seen before that Nintendo stuff goes for quite a bit and Atari and a lot of the big name stuff. But during the, the 90s, there was a lot of um, PC games that were... Uh, ported across from different uh, consoles onto PC. Now, often uh, they weren't successful or sometimes there was unique ones on the PC that uh, were successful and you couldn't get on other systems. And it was the beginning of sort of uh, where people sort of went from just having the one system in their house, the Atari or the Nintendo or the Commodore 64, to a whole lot of different options. And this was one of the options. I tell you what, if you're a kid in the 90s, you could fool your parents into getting a computer um, to play games by saying, oh, look, get me get me a, a, a Mac or something. It's for homework. And then as soon as you get it, you just use ga games on it. That, and this was where the PC games um, came into their own for kids who had a PC because their parents didn't want them having a gaming system. Yeah, exactly right. The fact that it's a multiplayer one too is interesting because not a lot of people could multiplayer back then. But anyway, let's have a look, shall we? So, uh, oh, hang on. We've got, oh, there's, oh, 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 oh hang on, sorry, wrong button. I've got to go up here. Uh, Gavin has kicked us off at five. Uh, Angie's at 5,000. There's a bit of a difference, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Joshua's at eight. Collins at 115. Carol is at 50 cents. I think that is. Oh, okay. Jeffro is at five. Uh, Joel, who knows his games, is at 3,300. Uh, Dave is at 78. Jared's at 75. The Vile violating this game at 13. <laughs> Greg has gone for the judicial garage sale, $2. Uh, William's at 60. Adrian, good to see Adrian joining us at 33.01. Rob uh, is at 5.50. Uh, Christy's at 15. Thomas is at 70. And, uh, yes, now, did you say you had something to say about Rob today uh, for the show? Yeah, or just, I... just, um, just while we remember it, a big happy birthday to uh, Rod's daughter who turned 18 over the weekend. And it was really nice that she was going to have a big party and Rod hired... Um, removalist from sydney to come and bring some of the party stuff down and it never happened so sorry about that your dad didn't mean it yeah some people do anything to not have an 18th birthday party uh all right uh joe is at 1400 
And uh, Thomas said, Tim has said uh, 105. So there you go. All right. So what do you reckon this went for? Uh, fire flight, uh, fire fight road, multiplaying game PC. Yeah, big box retro. Very, very good. And the price went for a whopping. Look at that. Oi. What do you reckon? Now that surprised me because often you will go into your your local op shop and see a bunch of old PC games, and I wouldn't give them a second look. I might if they've got Star Wars on them or something like that, but they're the type of thing that are not on my radar at all. Now this must obviously be a really rare game. I have never seen it before, um, so I don't really know the history. But if you look, there was a few bids on it, so there was a few people after it, and it went for quite a bit. All right, so it's funny. Like Joel uh, had this at three three thousand and three hundred, three thousand three hundred, right? But he was pipped. Uh, actually, three thousand three hundred. But he was pipped at the post by Adrian by one one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? This is forty nine bucks like, cheaper. Um, there you go. How good is that? Well done, Mister Adrian. Well done, sir. It's like um, the price is right, where whoever was the last person to put the bid on would be a bastard and do one dollar more than the next highest bid and always win. Yeah, exactly right. And Joel's right. Yeah, 3000 It's a lot of money for a game like of that uh, vintage is absolutely insane. So there you go. All right, we move on. So let's, uh, yes, go for it. Back to the uh, the classics, Nintendo Game & Watch Donkey Kong. Uh, a lot of people would have had this growing up because it was one of the biggest selling games ever. Um, I know that if, if you wanted to be in with the, the cool crowd when I was at school, you had to have a game and watch to sit down and not socialise with everyone during recess and lunch. This is in particularly nice condition because not only do you get the game, you get the box, you get the inserts, you get the warranty, you get the instructions and you've got a couple of... Um, batteries there as well. So this is a very nice version of Donkey Kong, the original Game & Watch handheld version. Very good. There's a few discussions on the thing here about people copying other people's scores and all the rest of it. It's like, it's okay, it got sold. Someone else has already bought it. So uh, build a bridge. Let's move on, shall we? All right. So what do we all reckon this uh, went for? Uh, Gavin said he still has one, which is kind of cool. So uh, there you go. All right. And just said 350 uh, oh, the Tashta who has a birthday this week is at 6000 bucks. Well done. And make sure, hey, Tash, you say hello to the little dude for me. Uh, and, and I don't mean spanking, uh, as you well know. Uh, Gavin has said 435 Jeffro has said 71 bids. That's not a price, Jeffro. That's a 71 bids. All right. Uh, Colin has said 5500 uh, Joel said 550 uh, Dave, a uh, new one to the show. It's absolutely good to see you, Dave. is at 1000 Carol's at 495 uh where are we where are, da, da, da. <laughs> jared said a dollar more than whatever joel says <laughs> i love that <laughs> um adrian has said hang on i've lost adrian adrian has said 555 he's doing a, an inch joshua's at 200 rob's at 750 jared's at 490 the vile violating this at 1980 that was a very good year uh jimmy has said good jimmy's joining us for the first time i think so it's absolutely fantastic at 550 april all the way from scotland has said fifteen thousand. Chrissy has said 780 and Thomas has said 30. What a real mixed bag of bunnies, eh, in terms of what these things are worth. So everybody remembers these when they came out. And a lot of people remember playing them and having fun with them and all the rest of it. Now, of course, they're all collectibles. Uh, I've still got more coming in. So I said Chris, Thomas at 30. Chris was at 150. Uh, hey. <laughs> Jeff Rose fallen one more than Jared's bid. So there you go. So Joel <laughs> does this, Jared does that, and Jeff Rose does that. <laughs> Uh, and Travis uh, said 300. All right, so what do you reckon this went for? Nintendo Game & Watch, Donkey Kong, multi-screen console. When, when they could fold over, fold open and make the screen double, that was absolutely fantastic. So there you go. Oh, and Tim has said 750. So there you go. And the price went for 530. What do you reckon of that, kiddies? That was about what I would expect. I, I, I've seen them going higher over lockdown than that for an original boxed donkey kong in nice condition so there you go that's about what what i'd be selling it for in the shop if i had one about five hundred dollars well i'll tell you who didn't get it tash didn't get it at six thousand so <laughs> she was going to sell her first all that, for that extra money to spend on the jurassic park high heels yeah very good. yeah she was going to sell her firstborn for that one <laughs> the little dude uh i reckon to, uh, jimmy has this at 550 gets 20 bucks back so uh, there you go. How good is that, kids? Very, very cool. All right. So, uh, yes, very groovy. All right, we move along. We're running behind schedule, but we'll, we'll be right. Go for it. Here we go. It's a Nintendo controller. Um, anyone who had a Nintendo 64 would remember these controllers. Um, they're not rare. They've um, every Everyone who bought a Nintendo got one. Uh, this is a bit special because it's a bold, uh, a gold and black, but it's in used condition. Um. How much would you expect to pay just for a Nintendo controller? 
these were an absolute pain in the ass to use because you have to use your thumb on the joystick, and that just was not practical at all. So uh, there you go. Uh, where are we? Uh, hang on, I've sort of lost where we started. Jared's bid, da 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 da, because there's so much going on. Uh, ten, a hundred dollars off. Okay, Colin has said twelve. Gavin has said seventy-five. Um, Adrian has said thirty. Joel said, "What about me?" Uh, I'm obviously thinking about the song, moving pictures. Um, uh, where are we? Dave is at four hundred. Josh was at twenty. I'll check it again in a sec, Joel. Uh, Ange is at fifteen. Jesus Christ, is it more sense than he knows what to do with there for Ange? Uh, four ninety-five from Dave. Tash has decided to keep the first born and gone for eighty bucks. Chrissy's at fifty cents. Uh, <laughs> very good. It isn't fair. <laughs> I don't have enough, and I want my share. Uh, Joel's at seven thousand five hundred. Uh, where are we? Jimmy's at 75, Rob is at five, Carol's at 150, Jared's at 295. Violating this hard controller is the vial at seven bucks. April has said a hundred bucks. Uh, okay, Joel said these things are quite rare, so there you go. Uh, Thomas has said 225, and Tim says 300. Not too sure who Tim is, but uh, that's uh, all good to see. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Very good stuff, but uh, yes, the old Nintendo controller. So anyway, we're going to move on. Uh, can't see you. I want to leave. Yeah, righto. Um, very good. Okay, uh, Nintendo 64 Gold Logo E3 Game Controller. What do you reckon this is worth, kiddies? It is worth a whopping $7,500 freaking dollars. Oh, now, now, this one really floored me because I was like, what? Um, but then I went and looked it up, and there was less than 50 of them made. Most of them are in wrecked condition. And this isn't a... Um, you know, one of those things that are not as an anomaly. I looked back and a couple have sold for this price. So that is what they're worth. Um, so some of the people who bid 50 cents were way off on this one. Yeah. So Natasha, Tasha, who actually had 6,000 the first time around, might not have done too bad on this one, but Joel <laughs> has got it right on the head at 7,500. Maybe he was the one who sold it. You never, never know. So how about that? How insane is that? God. I know that another one of those things that um, if you saw it around in a big collection of Nintendo, I wouldn't have given it a second thought. So there you go. Totally agree with you. Probably still has the DNA of the people whose thumbs have been pressing those uh, controllers. Very good. All right, two to go. Here we go. Here's some of my favourites. This is Star Wars Atari cartridges, but they're nice because they're um, they're still boxed and boxed and have all their um, instructions. Uh, there is Return of the Jedi, the arcade game, the Empire Strikes Back, and Jedi Arena. Jedi Arena was one of my favourites because when you got the Atari, you got cartridges and you got paddles, and you used the paddles on, like, the tennis, and that was about it, until this game came along and you used them to control the lightsabers when you waved the lightsaber around, which was, which was very, very cool. And um, in the Empire Strikes Back, you could disable an ATAT by shooting it in the neck. And it's they an remember AT-AT, asshole. <laughs> And they remember they remembered that in um, Rogue One where they took the AT was it MT in that one? Yeah. <laughs> it was an AT ACT. That's right. The, the the Australian Capital Territory was taken down with a shot in the neck. <laughs> It was too. It was a bit of a wuss. <laughs> um, all right. So very, very good. All right. Uh, arcade games for good old Atari. I mean, I tell you what, these used to bust your hands big time because there was so much handwork going on. All right. So uh, I have no idea where this starts, actually. So um, da dang. Okay. I think Ange starts this off at. A, well, I can't even read all that. There's a lot of ones. So very good, Ange. Uh, Collins said 1,200. Uh, I agree, Jared. Actually, the box art was actually the best part of it. Um, 12, uh, 1300 for Dave. Violating this at 1138. I can't, don't blame me on that one. Is the vial 1500 for Joshua? Joel has said 350. Rob has said 450. Thomas is at, uh, was at 2600. And Tim says 1000. Carol has said 2400. Uh, <laughs> very good, Jared. At, at. Oh, yeah, it's very, very good. <laughs> um, oh, I've completely lost where I'm at. Okay, so Jared said 380. Um, Gavin has said five million Republic credits, so they're no good here. Uh, 450 from April. Adrian has said 500. Uh, Greg has chucked in two bucks each. <laughs> He's gone for the each at least. Uh, Jimmy, good to see Jimmy here. Is at 400. Joe is also uh, hang on the wrong button. Uh, do you accept children? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll accept a couple. Why not? Uh, 15, was it 1,500? And Dave has said 2,600. I think everybody remembers these when they first came out, the old Atari games. And, uh, yeah, so I remember the Empire Strikes Back. One thing was the greatest thing ever, but I'll tell you what, it gave you thumb aches and art, uh, arm aches like you would not believe. Um, 
Jared has said uh, 389 and six Druidians are very, very cool. All right, let's find out what this is worth. Uh, Star Wars arcade games from the old Atari 2600. The price went for a whopping. Look at that, 350. 350, which I, again, thought was really reasonable for that. And I actually think if they'd split them up and done four auctions, they would have got more. The, the Star Wars arcade game is actually quite hard to get on the Atari, and you don't really see it around much. So that was a good pickup for anyone who um, was looking for the old Atari cartridges. Now I know why Joel's watching this show because look at that. He even gets a he gets one cent back. How good <laughs> is that? Oh geez, I tell you what. Well done, sir. Very very cool. Yes, he's on fire. It's very good. All right, now let's see if you can uh, get a three for three, Mister Joel. All right, so got our last item for the night uh, from the eBay's. It is this Mario sixty four. Remember, he just sold for two billion dollars just recently. <laughs> so yeah, Mario sixty four. It was the game that launched. Um, the Nintendo 64, one of the most popular games ever. Quite hard to get boxed. Um, it isn't rare, but it is hard to get in really nice condition with a good box like that. How much would you pay to um, play with your little Mario? <laughs> it's a me. Very, very good. All right, so what does everybody like new? doesn't mean it is new, but it's like new. So there you go. So what does everybody think? Mario 64, that's it. No long description. It just says two words. Mario 64. Uh, no looking this up and no Googling it. Kitties either you know it or you don't know it. No cheating, all right? All right, Natasha, she's prepared to sell the, the, the little dude once again for 350 <laughs> Uh Jimmy's at 250 So uh, what do you reckon, kids? Uh, oh, whoop, sorry. Uh, hang on. Uh, Dave has said 700 Oh, there's some big numbers, isn't there? Colin said 755 It's very, very close. Joshua has said 750 William is at one. 120. Joel, hang on, shit. Joel is at five, so he's gone right against the trend. Adrian's at 5,000. Carol is at 780. Thomas is at two bucks, so he's not obviously very keen on this. Uh, April's at 300. Jared is at five dollars. Ange is also at two dollars. Uh, and uh, there we go. Uh, da, 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 da. And Rob is at 300. So we got a real mixed bag of bunnies. Um, the vial is at 1250 with pepperoni. <laughs> right, I think, I think the uh, only thing he's violating there is his wallet. <laughs> violating that mario what can i say uh so christy has said 15 tim says 550 uh yeah 60 dollars post 60 dollars postage uh, like the obviously sending this via the um was it the blue galactic thing that just launched the other day blue origin so there you go um and uh yeah so anybody else uh we're running a little bit behind time here on this one so we might finish this one a bit early so what do you reckon we're for mario 64 there it is, like new, absolutely fantastic. And how much would you expect us to pay for Mario? A whopping of oh, five bucks. <laughs> so that is an amazing bargain, even with the postage. Um, every copy of that I get boxed in would probably go for a hundred bucks straight away. Well, guess what? You wouldn't believe it, right? So Jared had this at four ninety nine, right? <laughs> but following the nine system didn't work. Joel got it for one right cent on more. Yeah. Absolutely, five bucks. The reason that didn't the reason that didn't attract bids because people are going to search for Mario sixty four Nintendo, and as soon as you put Nintendo in the description, that auction doesn't turn up. So that's another one of those things that um, went for that cheap because no one could find um, find the item. Absolutely fantastic. So yeah, well done, Joel. Uh, yes, you came here and you blitzed the field uh, very, very well. Uh, nicely done, sir. Very cool stuff. So what do you reckon about that, Mr. Uh, Aaron? So what are we talking about tonight, Mr. Aaron? Because we've got uh, we've got people watching the show. There's a lot of conversations going on. What are we on about tonight? We're going to talk about Doctor Who merchandise from the 70s because it's our favourite topic. <laughs> no, we're going to talk about... Video game licensed from movies, um, vintage ones, not so much the really recent stuff, but all the stuff we grew up with, the movies we love, the games that could be amazing or could be quite questionable or could be nothing to do with the movie at all um, because it was a real mixed bag. <laughs> so you just dangled this character, good old Greg, about Doctor Who, and he's gone all excited now, and now you're just going to shoot him down in flames. So there you go. Uh, now, we talked about Star Wars or not in this con conversation. No, we're going to let, let everyone know now, Star Wars, there are so many Star Wars video games, you could do an entire episode on Star Wars video games, and shall I tell them? What? What? Oh, tell That's them what. what we're going to do next week. So this week's general oh. video games, 
next week we're going to do one entirely on um, Star Wars video games. So if you're missing um, Star Wars tonight and you go, hang on, why haven't they done Star Wars? It's because we're going to ded dedicate a whole show to it next week. Very good. And like like Joel, he's not like, like Greg was looking the screen early for Doctor Who, but now Joel's looking the screen, interested in knowing what we're going to be talking about. We probably will run over time, but hey, everybody's in lockdown. You've got nowhere to go anyway, so you might as well just sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, off we go. Uh here we go. Uh, licensed games, they're a really interesting mi mixed bag, actually, because any um, anyone knows that if you can get an edge on a product to make it sell, you're going to take it. And producers and game makers realised um, pretty early on that people are going to buy a game if it's got brand recognition. So when someone released uh, Pac-Man, someone would release Ghost Muncher, Ghost Gobbler, all these different variants that sort of were the same game, um, but they could get away with uh, copying it and, and releasing it themselves. And of course, when, when this is happening all the time, you're eventually going to get someone hit on the bright idea that, hey, we can um, use movies to help promote the game. I mean, we might have a an average game, but if we call it a Masters of the Universe game, all the Masters of the Universe uh, fans and kids who watch the show are going to suddenly buy that. And, you know, back in the day when we just had the pixels on the 8-bit machines, it was the fantastic cover art on the picture that was what won you. And then all the games were pretty average because, you know what, if you tried to make a character look like anything, you're never going to be able to do it because it's just like like dots. So you could really brand anything with any franchise and say, hey, this is this game. So the very first uh, sort of branded uh, and licensed games were, were quite questionable. Um, speaking of which, Dave has asked if you got any Spaceballs merchandise. I don't think they produced that much, did they? I have um, Spaceballs the soundtrack on tape somewhere, and I think that's about the only thing I've got. And Spaceballs the badge, which I got at the Royal Melbourne show sometime. Very, very cool. All right, so we're moving on to this. Yeah, so you could see all through the um, the eighties, they would um, produce games uh, that were licensed from different movies, and it became pretty obvious that the blockbuster movies that were scheduled were the ones that licensees would try and get the games for. And you can see here, this is like the blockbuster Hollywood collection that has all the big hitters. You've got your your Indiana Jones and your Batman and your Ghostbusters and, and your Robocop. And by this stage, the, the graphics, you could actually tell the characters were who they were meant to be. Um, so we're going to take a, a nostalgic look back through the early days of licensed games and, and, and come through right through to the 90s. We, we, won't, we won't come right up to the present day, but um, we'll, have a, we'll have a good look at what was out there. Very good. <clears throat> So I don't know if anybody knows what the very first licensed game was. And I said we wouldn't be looking at any Star Wars games. And you know what? We're not looking at any Star Wars games because that TIE Fighter there was from an unlicensed game called Space Laser, um, which wasn't licensed and nothing to do with Star Wars, but all the ships um, in it, you know, looked like Star Wars ships. And I think at the time, because no one had done it, um, no one really knew what to do or if they could sue them or what licensing was and all of that kind of thing for computer games. And there's a, a couple of games there. Um, on the left, you've got one based on Death Race 2000, which isn't the first licensed game ever because they didn't actually buy the license for it. And on the other side, there's Jaws. And that isn't a licensed game either because they, they just made a, a shark game and called it Jaws. But the very first licensed game ever is in the middle there. It's not from a movie. It's from the TV show Happy Days, and it's the Fonz bike racing game. So I was surprised by that because I knew there was a lot of licenses, but I did not know that Fonzie would be the very first licensed game. Well, the thing is you don't even need 20 cents to play. You just walk up to him and go, hey, and you do the thumbs up and just, there's a credit for you. <laughs> And I also think the um, the Star Wars game there is um, the background to my sex computer game um, uh, music video. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. And I always thought it was a Star Wars game. And suddenly today they're not as cool because it's just an unlicensed game that looked like Star Wars. Very good. Now, two questions here. Chrissy has said, is he jumping the shark? Uh, and Dave has asked the same question. <laughs> so there you go. Put Jaws, well, actually, could, if you put Jaws and Fonz together, then you would actually have that, uh, literally, wouldn't you? That is, I, I should have thought of that joke. But you could say if the very first licensed game was jumping the shark, it only is downhill from here on in. So <laughs> we'll have to see what they come up with. Now, we're not looking at every single licensed game because... 
there are hundreds of them. And as I said, we, we couldn't even do Star Wars on this show because that's a whole show in one. So we're going to take a look through the stuff I remember, the particularly good stuff, the particularly bad stuff, and some of the funny stuff as well. So um, Fonz was the first upright um, licensed game. And there's a bit of debate what was actually the first licensed home video uh, game. Uh, I don't know if anyone could have a guess. Um, probably the delay means it's not worth even um, <laughs> waiting. But there are, is this, there are two. Is this the next slide? Yeah. yeah. Very good. Okay, so there you go. All right, let's move on. So there were two games that, um, if you Google it, say that they were the first licensed game. Raiders of the Lost Ark from 1982 and Tron also from 1982. Now there's a bit of debate online because Raiders of the Lost Ark was meant to be the first one, but a lot of people say Tron actually snuck in and even though Raiders of the Lost Ark was planned to come out after Tron, Tron got in first. So considering the the topic of Tron and how it's on gaming and in, in a game machine, it's quite you know appropriate that Tron is probably the first um, licensed game to make it in, into everybody's homes. This is um, the Tron arcade machine, which um, is great because it has four different levels, all from the, the movie, uh, different scenes. I remember not being able to find this when it was out, and it's quite interesting. These were quite rare in Australia. They brought a couple in for movie theatres, but arcade machines and i think joel would, would know about this they have um step down transformers in because we have a different voltage to america and the tron machine didn't have one so if you bring one in from america and you plug it in you blow the machine up um and to get one fixed here costs quite a bit of money so you'd import the machine and then you would have to um have it customized so you could play it locally and you know what back in those days if you had an arcade you probably didn't want to be importing the machine and then spending more money on it uh customizing it so there aren't a lot of them in australia i've only ever seen a couple it's a really good game to play the machine is a beautiful piece of art it lights up and has um, black lights in it and things like that and it has a really good understanding of gaming mechanics in that you can play the light cycles, you can play fighting the spiders that are only in the movie for about one scene and everyone forgets. Um, there's the tanks and then there's fighting the um, the CPU. Um, and, and once you've done that though and mastered that, it's just the same, same levels over and over, but faster and faster and harder to do. So if you get a chance, um, there was a fantastic uh, exhibition uh, at Acme a few years ago that um, had old retro gaming machines. Um, if you have a chance, it's a good one to check out. Yeah, I think uh, Joel had a hand in a fair bit of that, and he did confirm that uh, Raiders was definitely first, just came out late. So uh, there you go. Uh, it's no surprise that they produced the Tron game, considering that Tron the movie was all about games. Uh, so uh, it just seemed a pretty logical thing for them to do. Uh, and I agree with Dave that um, the last Starfighter, you would think the Starfighter game within the movie would have been produced, and it wasn't. So... It was a bit yeah. of a bizarre one, wasn't it? So, there you it's go. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, watch it sound like you're stuck in like Flynn. So there you go. Uh, okay, we'll move on. So you could go to your arcade, probably not so much in Australia, and play the Tron machine. But there was also different versions of different Tron games you could take home. And I remember um, really, really wanting uh, Tron Deadly Discs, which was basically... Um, the scene from Tron where they throw their um, their discs at each other. Atari brought out a few different Tron games. I really like down the bottom there where they've got the Atari um, logo made out of the light cycles. The Tron discs were particularly nice because they were in um, neon uh, blue cartridges. And again, the, the Atari 2600 is one of those machines where the box art often sold the game and then when you got into the game, it was quite, you know, simple. The thing, though, there was nothing better than to than that to compare it with. And I remember as a kid, um, graphics were important, but there wasn't, you know, amazing graphics on anything. Um, if you went to the arcade, you could see things with better graphics. So where people look at this kind of uh, graphics now and laugh, like it was cutting edge and to be playing it at home was absolutely amazing. Did you grow up? Did you have an Atari? No, I never had the money. For, oh, so I, I come from an impoverished background. We were lucky to have uh, milk that wasn't powdered. Um, so, no, I never got to see any of this stuff. Uh, here's a question for you, though. Uh, the discs from Tron, what were they called? Um, they were the 
the ID discs, won't they? Oh, yes. So you mean you need a few more letters? Identity discs. So yes. they actually call them that now. Actually, they're not a deadly disc. They're I know what they are. Discs. They are Attack. identity discs. So there you go. They actually, say that in the movie, you'll each receive an identity disc. So there you yeah. go. Uh, very, very cool. Um, uh, and you know what, Dad? They're, they're deadly. Yeah, they are deadly, I'll tell you what. So, uh, yes, he's, uh, Chris's grandparents had it on in television, which is kind of cool. Uh, yes, Jared, Frisbees. Uh, that's exactly pretty much what they were too. So, uh, yes, yeah. very, very cool. Well, i tell you what. Like, if you had an Intellivision, you were the coolest kid. When we were growing up, you had the Atari, and a couple of people had the Intellivision, but it was the more expensive unit that had a whole lot more different games on it. So, um, yeah, quite lucky. Here's a couple more. Um, uh, games based on the Tron franchise that came out in the early 80s. You could see you could actually get Tron packages that came with their own joysticks as well, which is pretty cool. I've never had one of those. I, when I was looking into this, I saw them online, and I think the bottom of the joystick's meant to look like the disc as well. Um, and then there's the little take-home uprights that you could get, and they did this for a lot of different games, but the Tron one is particularly hard to get, and I don't know if it was because it didn't sell really well at the time, but you find a lot of the uprights of um, Donkey Kong and Pac-Man and those. The Tron one is really hard to find. So if you've got one, hold on to it or don't sell it at Greg King's garage sale for two bucks, that's for sure. I've got to agree with you. A lot of the Tron merchandise does actually look very, very schmick. Um, and uh, yeah, having the whole light system going around um, everything and uh, yeah, it can look very, it, very it cool. Is funny. It is funny with Tron where... When I was growing up, there was almost, uh, if you like Tron, a, a nerd stigma to it. And even, you know, 20 years ago in The Simpsons, they have that thing where they go, it looks like like Tron, and everyone's like, oh, Tron, you know, and Chief Wiggum gets sort of mocked for it. But now things have spun around where all oh, that's really cool and all really really retro, and if you're into that kind of stuff, you, you are the, co the coolest kid. So this was The Adventures of Tron, which kind of um, – had some of the arcade uh, levels, it had the discs, and it also had this weird level where you skate round like almost on roller skates on computer chips to, to get through a maze kind of thing, which is quite bizarre. But um, the Tron games definitely have a charm to them, and because of the original Tron movie and what they were based on, they, they kind of are very true, true to their origins. Um, so if they had to release the sequel game called The Adventures of Crom, C-R-O-M, would have just been all over in a couple of seconds because he's the one who dies at the start, at the start oh, when he's fighting Flynn. Uh, yeah, you, you think you're going to wipe me right out, don't you? So he's, he doesn't last very long at all. So the Adventures of Crom, yeah, it wasn't exactly a big seller. <laughs> that would be a Conan game, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly right. So, yeah, that was Peter Jurassic who played that, uh, the guy who plays uh, Londa Malari from Babylon 5. So there you go. Yeah. Very good. Here we go, though. This is officially uh, the very first uh, licensed game, and it's, Raiders of the Lost Ark came out on the Atari and a couple of other other things. Um, I remember looking at Raiders of the Lost Ark when it came out and looking at Pitfall and thinking Pitfall was better. And when I played Pitfall, in my head, that was Indiana Jones anyway. So, so I never had Raiders of the Lost Ark growing up. It looks like quite a cool game. Again, it's one of those games when you look at the screens it is like um, very, very basic graphics representing um, what they're meant to be. There's different icons on the bottom which represent Indy's whip and different items you can use. And it's basically one of those games where you navigate different challenge levels and then you get to the Ark of the Covenant at the end and you um, get to take the Ark. Now, down the bottom there, I found some 8-bit artwork of top melting which every kid would have loved, but it wasn't actually on the Atari cartridge. <laughs> we haven't really got to the era yet where kids um, were, were playing these games and parents were like, well, hang on a second, these are pretty violent. And you can understand why they got a lot of, got away with a lot of um, shoot 'em ups and stuff during this era because the graphics were so poor, you really couldn't see anything that's going to be called graphic um, at the time. No, I, I agree with you that uh, it is it is so uh, rudimentary that by today's standards, even like 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, it was considered quite poor. But you're right, right. The fact you could actually play at home on a television, you plug it in and away you go, uh, and providing it wasn't like it was some games where you had to all load them from an audio tape, because uh, I remember having to do this at a friend's place, and it takes like 20 minutes to load the game from an audio tape. Once you've had a cartridge and it just went off, and away yeah. she went. It was like the greatest thing in the entire universe. And I think people just accepted it and said, oh, okay, you know what? We'll just deal with what we've got. And because uh, they didn't know yeah. any different. And I totally agree with you on that one. So, uh, yeah, very, very cool. 
So Indiana Jones was a popular franchise and also um, Lucasfilm uh, owned LucasArts, which was the own, their own software warehouse which meant there were some quality Indiana Jones games because the people who were making it um, were actually linked to the franchise. It was Lucasfilm. I think a lot of the time um, licensed games go wrong is because someone has a game and then they pick a franchise that will fit the game, whereas LucasArts were very thoughtful that they would make the game around what makes the franchise enjoyable. By the time they got to The Last Crusade, they actually released two games at the same time. They released two different games. They released the arcade adventure, which was more of your platform run along, beat em up. And then there was also the, um, there was also the graphic, um, the graphic adventure where you could, it was more a point and click and read the clues and um, solve puzzles, a bit like um, Secret of Monkey Island, if anyone remembers that game. Now, both of those were really good games. Um, I think I had both of them on the Amiga uh, and spent many, many hours playing both of them. The, the really interesting thing I found though, um, researching this, I loved games and I grew up gaming and I'd get a lot of games. But I never completed any of the games. They were they were too hard for me. So I was looking at these and remembering the games. And then I'd go, do you know what? I remember getting up to this point and not being able to get any further. And the really crazy thing, you go on YouTube and the games that I played for months and months and kept me entertained for ages, you can watch the YouTube run through and someone does the whole game in 18 minutes. And you're just like, <laughs> how is that possible? I thought I was quite good, but um, obviously not as good as I thought I was. Yeah, a lot of people are really into the um, Indiana Jones. So Dave, uh, sorry, Jared said that Dave Nolan yeah, got that was a great game and everybody loved it. And uh, yeah, Joel obviously uh, loved it as well. So yeah, uh, yeah, I agree with you, Dave. It belongs in the museum. So yes, yeah, very, very yeah. cool. We have got some in, in shots as well. And, and here shots. we go, sort of um, the the more modern stuff. Uh, the one at the top there is the. Uh, I guess it was released on a few systems, but that's the Super Nintendo version of uh, Indiana Jones. I think it was called The Greatest Adventure. And that was pretty much all the movies in one. And you can see there the giant rock that um, never stops as he runs through the level and it just chases him all the way through. I do remember the... Um, the snow in the raft was quite a fun level. And then, of course, uh, the rope bridge with Mola Ram was also a good level on that one. At the bottom is a really interesting uh, Indiana Jones game. The Infernal Machine was one of the last games produced for the Nintendo 64. It was never released in Australia and it came so close to being released, I actually had it on pre-order. The last game I brought for the Nintendo 64 was StarCraft. And when I bought StarCraft, they said, oh, Indiana Jones is coming out. Do you want to put your name down for uh, pre-order? I'm like, yep, no problem. Of course I will. They had all the advertising out. I remember a banner hanging from the roof with like a, um, a mobile advertising it. And then in America, it sort of came out as a Blockbuster video exclusive. So they were the only store that sold it. And I had my pre-order on pre-order for maybe about a year and a half. And then they just said, uh, it's never coming out. Interestingly enough, I have seen two PAL cartridges turn up on eBay. They must have been like promo ones that were sent out to Australia or Europe um, for, I don't know, to show uh, people how it was gonna be when it eventually came out. When Nintendo stuff wasn't going for that much, sort of games were going for like 20, 30 bucks, this went for about 600 and I was like, I'm not paying $600 for that game. Fast forward about 10 years, um, when it turned up again and, and Nintendo stuff's gone through the roof, I think it went for about 7,000. So... It's yeah, but that's the story things. of your life, though. You've got millions of stories of things that you could have got for a certain price, you didn't get them, and then they end up like going for billions of dollars later on. So, yeah, being there, done that. Harden up, Aaron. Build a bridge, son. It's happened to you plenty of times, and it's going to keep on happening. So, there <laughs> It'll you go. Happen again. But uh, uh, yeah, it's just your fun stories of missing out on items that end up you know, costing a fortune years later. Yeah, whatever, what, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it does. Anyway, yeah. let's move on, shall we? Um, so Daniel has mentioned Dune and Dune Tomb, which I don't think we actually have in this presentation. Dune was definitely based on the movie, uh, yeah. and it wasn't an action game. It was like a very thought-provoking story game. But Dune Two, 
uh, use the uh, it's funny I should know this June 2 actually used the engine the uh, the gaming engine that ended up being command and conquer which then went on to red alert and the way we way we went so but June in yeah. particular was actually really really good although it was a little bit like you don't get to do a lot of action it was all like traveling around and building communities and all this other bullshit so but it was definitely based on the film which is kind of cool which uh, June spice. 2 was not Hey, yeah. mining the spice. So there you go. Uh, very good. All right, we move on to a bit of ghosty action. So another one of the big franchises was Ghostbusters, and it's really interesting reading people's reaction to this game now because a lot of people um, who get into retro gaming go back and play a lot of games, um, and it gets quite a bad rap of having nothing to do with the movie and not fun to play and too long. Now, when I got this game, I thought this was like one of the best games ever. Um, you are basically starting up a Ghostbuster franchise. You are given a certain amount of cash to buy equipment at the beginning of the game. You play the game. It has a finite time because the um, the slime or the e what is it, ectoplasm is slowly rising in the city. And when it gets past, I think, 10,000, that's when Zul will come and destroy the city. So every game lasts about 45 minutes. You collect as many ghosts through the um, through the game. Um, that gets you money, and then there's a marshmallow attack, and if you can destroy that, it gets you more money, and then if you can sneak past the marshmallow man and get up to Zool and destroy Zool, um, the city rewards you. Now, what was amazing about this game, and I don't really remember it in any other game from the period, you would get your bank account and money would go into it, and they would give you a code, and you could turn your computer off, and then you, next time you play it, you put the code in and it goes, welcome back, Aaron. This is how much money you've got in your bank. And at the time, no money, no game. You could turn the game off and come back to it and keep going from where you um, played from. So for years and years and years, I built up a bank account and expanded my Ghostbusters franchise. Now, I thought that was a fantastic game. Apparently, people now don't think that's close enough to the um, the Ghostbusters movie to be a, be a good tie-in. Um Kyle has said nobody remembers the items you bought for ten bucks, and twenty years later sold for ten bucks. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bought a Batman jigsaw puzzle, which was from the nineteen sixties. I saw it again in the nineteen nineties, and it had not appreciated one cent. It was only three bucks, and I nearly cried my eyes out. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I certainly remember those things. So, anyway, move, move on. So, I was still a big Ghostbusters fan when um, Ghostbusters two came out, um, and this 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 movie was basically replicated in the game where it started um, with you going down into the sewer, finding the, the slime, uh, working your way through the city. In the end of it, you got into the um, Statue of Liberty and walked through and defeated, um, you defeated, what's his name? Carpathian. Oh, I only um, saw the movie once, so I can't remember. The, the gold dude. Yeah. The, well, he's the car. He's the he was what was he Vigo, Vigo, Vigo the Carpathian. Um, yes. So yeah, this was good. so so this was an example of a game that quite kind of mimicked the movie, and I didn't think it was as much fun as the game that um, like did its own thing with the movie as sort of its base where it went from. Had better graphics um, because it was a couple of years later. Had better sound. It was an okay game, but that they were the games for the Ghostbusters franchise. See, typically when we can't remember the name of something, somebody will write the answer up for us because obviously they think we're a pair of knobs here, but no one's written up the answer to who the gold guy is, so clearly nobody else else knows either. <laughs> Memorable. <laughs> I've actually I've actually been to Carpathia and I walked around going, where's Vigo? And everyone thought I was an idiot. Um, yeah, that's exactly not, right. Not Vigo more more. Either. Very, mm. very cool. All right, get a bit of Goonies action. Now, Goonies was a fantastic game because, again, I had it when I was growing up. And it was a puzzle game, um, like a, a side-scrolling puzzle game, and you could do different things. But I thought it was a particularly good game because the Goonies were a certain age and the puzzles were pitched at kids that age. So it was a little bit tricky, but it wasn't too tricky to get through. Um, the levels were very um, reminiscent of the movie, so you'd have to go through the deserted diner and you'd have to knock the water over to put the fire out to get down into the caves and then when you got through the caves there'd be all different traps and it was a little bit like a maze and a little bit of puzzle solving but it was a very good game for kids and again it's one of those where you can see the graphics isn't amazing but the the gameplay was so good that it, it held up and of course it has fantastic covers so while you play the game you look at the the, the cover of the um 
the game and, you know, it sort of gets you across the line with what you're looking at with the average graphics. Very cool. Now, in game world, Goonies managed to, the gaming world managed to do what Goonies couldn't. There was a there was a sequel. There was Goonies two, and again, I remember this coming out and being really really disappointed by the whole thing after the first game being pretty amazing. So uh, the graphics were slightly better. The gameplay was 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 totally different. Um, but it is interesting to see that there was enough interest in Goonies and it was popular enough that they created Goonies two and went ahead with the franchise even though they didn't make a movie. Very cool. Joel's mentioned about on the Famicom they thought a second movie was coming out, so uh, there you go. Well, I was movie. I was young enough. I actually remember when Goonies 2, the game, came out, waiting for the movie to come out as well um, because back then there was no internet to sort of say, no, nah, you're wrong, there is no movie coming out. So you see Goonies 2, the game, and you think there's a movie coming out. Very cool. For those who like a bit of Lamal action, you can start singing your head off. Well, I'm not going to do it because everyone had done just drop out of the. Well, I actually knew a guy once. He had he had a Walkman on, right? And this is when Walkmans were really, really revolutionary. <laughs> and of course, he's singing the song, not realizing that he can he, he can't he, we can't hear the song. We can only hear his voice. Never ending story. La 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 la. <laughs> you know, well, your dogs were howling over that, just like the, they're howling the, now. Anyway, continue. The fantastic thing that I haven't actually spoken about <laughs> is a lot of these games would have <laughs> really, really good. Um, 8-bit soundtracks and you know it's usually just one or two notes like banging out or pinging out the um the theme tune to different um franchises but they were i always thought they were amazing i didn't put any on this because i knew what would happen we just get like copyright striked and that'd be it but hey, um, if i can make my ears bleed you can make your ears bleed too so there you go so hard up everybody just deal with it you know whatever <laughs> so never ending story was a text adventure now, I don't know if anyone remembered text adventures. It was basically you um, put in commands and there was like um, some pictures and it would give you some option options. Uh, and sometimes you would be able to work out what was happening. Half the time on text adventures, I'd get totally stuck and not know what to do. So it wasn't a, wasn't one of those you run around and you fight stuff. It was it was more you you type stuff in and try and solve puzzles, but it was basically trying to solve your way to get to the next screen to load. Now, I remember a lot of text adventures on data set, what Dags was saying before, where you'd spend time on one level and then it'd say, okay, we're going to the next page, and then it would load for about 20 minutes. <laughs> it would really well, it's, break It's up. a never-ending story. That's what it's got to do, just never end. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so the never ending story, I remember being a particularly good one because the graphics that went along with it were quite evocative of the, the movie. Um, and it's one of those forgotten games. I don't really remember anyone um, remembering the never ending story. One thing about text games, though, it allowed you to use your imagination a lot more than seeing something on screen. And I knew people who would play them for a long period of time, probably more so than um, the graphic space games. So when you're doing text and you've got to write in stuff, obviously it wouldn't help if you say, I'm turning left, I'm turning right, and, and they think of saying, nah, try again, try again, try again, then you get the there shit some, and you smash it. But really good text games based on um, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide and a couple of his his ones that were really good. And um, there was a text game that me and a friend played all the way through called um, Aztec's Tomb. And we couldn't work out the very last thing. You had to put a diamond in a hole. And we could not work out the command to do it. And we actually looked up the guy that wrote it in the telephone book because he was in Australia. And we rang him. And to solve Aztec's tomb, you just had to put insert diamond. Um, we couldn't work that out. It's all about inserting something, isn't it? So there you go. All right. Very, very cool. So here we go. We're getting to the more sort of action franchises that do suit some of the, the faster side-scrolling shoot 'em up um, fighting games. This was the first RoboCop game. Um, it was released on a couple of different platforms. Uh, this one is the first time I've done this. There's often when you're growing up, you know, you had a Mega Drive and I had a 64 or I had a Amiga and stuff like that. And there was always people that preferred one to the other. And it is really funny because there's some comparisons there of um, Robocop on different platforms. And we've come ahead so far. Um, I remember people arguing like, was it better on the Nintendo or was it better on the Sega Mega Drive? You look at the graphics now, it looks exactly the same to me. They're both crap. <laughs> 
So who out there knows the three prime directives? Or the three prime directives? That's Star Trek, the three directives. Uh, I know there's four. Forget the fourth one. So uh, who wants to write down the three directives? So uh, there you go. Go for it. Yeah. Do you know so, what they are? Uh, they're like uh, Asimov's robot law, aren't they? No, not even remotely close. Anyway, continue on. See who writes down what, what. So, yeah, continue on. Yeah. So, yeah, so when, when I was growing up, um, I always thought the Amiga had the best graphics. Lots of people just, like, laughed at that because it wasn't a gaming computer uh, and said the Mega Drive or the 64. But like I was saying, you look at it there and, you know, I think they're all pretty comparable. They're all of their day. Nothing seems really better or worse, although there were there were huge playground arguments over that kind of thing. Very good. Uh, Jared is correct. That's Protect the Innocent. So there's one down and you've got two more to go, kiddies. So uh, there you go. Uh, very good. And that's the, that's the third one, Uphold the Law. And so what is the first one? And it is not Obey CC, OCP Executive. So uh, no. <laughs> Very, very good. Ah, oh, very good. We got it. Serve the public trust, protect the innocent, uphold the law, and of course, the fourth one was classified. Oh no! <laughs> and if you're going to look at RoboCop, then you've got to look at Terminator. Um, Terminator was another one of those franchises where, when the original Terminator came out, there wasn't a game. But in the lead up to Terminator Two, a lot of gaming companies realised, you know what, Terminator would make a good game. Um, so a few, so just before Terminator Two came out, Terminator came out. There's some of the um, the different uh, uh, systems that it was released on. I never had Terminator growing up. I always thought it was a, it was a really cool franchise, but I never really got into the game. Terminator looks a lot like um, the RoboCop game, though. So if we go mm -hmm. to the next slide, um, we have Terminator 2. Terminator 2 came out pretty much just after the, uh, the Terminator game, and you can see there's a few different systems that it came out on there. But Terminator and RoboCop, again in the gaming world did something that in the movies they didn't do and i think everyone would have loved do you know what that was dags oh no that's all right i've already pressed the button but uh, you're no, that, both together. No, that's okay we're, we're leading into it so here's some of the terminator 2 games and the graphics um there was shoot 'em up versions and there was um you know puzzle run um, and fighting versions uh, as well. But the, the thing I was I was leading into, they did something uh, with these franchises that I would have loved to have seen at the movies. They actually did a Terminator versus Robocop series of games or game. Um, and of course, when this came out, it raised an eyebrow because I see that and you think, oh, they're, they've done Aliens versus Predator. Oh, they're going to do Robocop versus Terminator. It seems like that sort of pretty natural um, progression, but they didn't. It was um, just in the gaming world where Schwarzenegger went up against David Weller. But um, they were one of those games that really took off, and they're still popular today, and it is one of those games that a lot of people uh, remember. So when that came out, um, I think... Terminator was at the peak of its um, popularity, so it was huge. And they also did Terminator versus Robocop comics. Um, I think um, Dark Horse did them, or one of those um, independents at the time. Yeah, I'm sure it uh, spurred a lot of conversations as to who would win and who would lose and the reasons why. And there's probably one side says this, the other side says that, and they're never going to agree. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah we, very, could have a, cool. we could have a discussion on that right now and there'd still be people like saying this, the Terminators would obviously crush him or like, no, Robocop would win. It'd still, it's one of those um, things that go on forever. Well, the fact that they tear Robocop uh, apart in the second movie uh, and there's like little kids involved in all the rest of it, you go, yeah, by that definition, you think Terminator would win. So that'd be uh, my, uh, that'd be my go. So, Well, do you know who wins? Like if you've got a good, good gamer, then RoboCop wins. And if you've got a bad gamer, then Terminator wins. <laughs> Good point. Like it. There you go. Love it. <clears throat> and these are some of the scenes from um, RoboCop versus Terminator. You can see there um, RoboCop is proudly holding aloft the Terminator skull. Um, there was Terminator um, robot dogs in this. Terminators galore. It would have it was a it would have been a pretty good game. Um, again, looking at it, I was going, yeah, lots of kids would have been into that. It was pretty violent for its time. This is at the beginning when kids are playing these things and parents are starting to look at it, going, well, the body count on this is getting pretty high, and the graphics are are getting realistic enough that we're getting a bit worried about this. 
you know what I would have pitched together? The Predator versus the Terminator. Now, that would be a bit of a good one, wouldn't it, eh? So, uh, yes, very, very cool. I don't know. Is have they ever done that in the comics? They, they could do. In gaming, it's one of those things you can do anything. It's just a matter of working the licenses out. And a lot of times you can't because there's um, creative differences between companies or they want bigger cuts of the pie. But sometimes they do. No, I'm just looking at it from purely from a discussion point of view. I think the Predator being a bit, a bit, a bit of bar, a badass and the Terminator, I reckon that would be an interesting sort of combination, that's for sure. So there you go. Sure. Speaking of combinations, EA team, look at that. The bat is back. Well, here we go. One of the big franchises um, from the 80s and 90s was, of course, uh, Batman. And I think Dags, everyone knows, is a big Batman fan. Did you have the Batman games? Uh, I have a couple of them, yeah. Uh, in fact, one of the things, you got the movie poster here, right, and I deliberately didn't buy it because I couldn't handle the fact they cut the edges of the logo off. I was so disgusted by that. Uh, so I didn't actually buy the movie posters. But uh, I've got a couple of them, yeah, which I've picked up somewhere in my travels, but I've never played them, obviously. So, uh, yeah. You, you would be really happy that the Mega Drive movie poster then actually had the complete Bat, Bat logo on. Yes, and then you can actually get a, uh, a widescreen version of the logo poster, which I have um, block-mounted, uh, which is just the logo uh, from the Batman 89 movie, and it, oh, absolutely Mickey Mouse. So, uh, yeah, love yeah. it. It is, it is a fantastic, it is fantastic. Batman was one of my favourite games. When they launched this Batman game, they also at the same time launched a retro game as well, but more looking at just ones based on movies. So um, this was a good game because it, again, was really led through uh, gameplay through the movie. So you fought uh, the at Access Chemicals and threw Jack Napier into the chemicals and then you went through um, Gotham City in the Batmobile and you actually could fire out uh, grappling hooks so you could do the really fast 90-degree turns around corners and things like that. You did um, spoil the Joker's balloons with the Batwing and um, take them out, out, in, out of the city and then you did climb the tower at the end and fight the goons and fight the Joker. So it was a really good game. If, if you liked the movie and you weren't a gamer and then you went and bought the the game because you liked the movie. You wouldn't have been disappointed with Batman. I remember that was a hard one to do, though. Spent a lot of time playing that. Uh, Dags missed out because he didn't even open his. No, nah, I didn't know. Nah. <laughs> I didn't have no computers in my house at that time. Uh, yeah, Batman, uh, Jared has said of Batman 89, then Team and in 90. Yeah, good time to be a kid, absolutely, except I was an adult at that point. So uh, there you go. It was in my early 20s. <laughs> and then um, they, they followed up with Batman Returns. Now, I don't know if anyone knows the controversy about Batman Returns, but um, Warner Brothers sold uh, the franchise rights to a lot of people promising it would be an amazing movie for kids. And when it came out, it was a lot darker and a lot less kid-friendly than, than people thought. And the game is quite dark too in that the graphics are dark and the, the game plays quite dark. I didn't get into Batman Returns, the game, as much as I did the, the first one. I was a little bit older and um, not so much into gaming anymore. But I was looking through it and it still seemed like a really good game and it still seemed like a game that followed the plots from the movie really well. Um, Again, it's one of those games that was huge at the time, um, but I don't know how well remembered it is now. I wonder if you get in one of the part of the gameplay, you get to burn, uh, use the um, Batmobile's uh, exhaust to uh, set one of the goons on fire so he burns to death. <laughs> well, I think that was actually meant, actually used in a Happy Meal, wasn't it? Because every kid <laughs> wants a crispy goon with their Happy Meal. Uh, you know, yes. got McDonald's pulled out of. Um, using Batman merchandise for their Happy Meals because of um, backlash from parents when they actually went and saw the movie. They weren't happy. Yeah, until this came out. <clears throat> exactly. Warner Brothers promised everyone that uh, the next Batman movie would be a lot more toy-friendly and um, a lot more kid-friendly as well. And it was, and it was really popular. And I never played this game, and researching this episode, I was looking it up, and it is actually... Um, on a lot of lists of one of the top 50 games ever. Um, it used, uh, I think, Mortal Kombat Fight Engine, which was revolutionary at the time. It had good gameplay, um, and it was quite uh, well regarded amongst gamers. And the interesting thing is um, there is a list I found, you know, the top 50 uh, rarest games and most expensive games, not based on um, people making, pulling stuff out of the air on what they actually sell for and this one generally goes uh in the special edition pack that i've got a picture of down the bottom there for about uh four and a half thousand us so six six thousand bucks if you want a nice copy of batman forever 
Um, it's interesting. It is a very green game, and it kind of follows uh, how the Riddler was in green, but a lot of it seems tinted green. It's a very stylistic game, and it does look quite nice from what I saw of it. So I don't know if anyone uh, played that. That was I was a bit too old to be playing the Batman games when that came out. Yeah, it's kind of funny. They really emphasize the Riddler's sort of design, but the Riddler in the movie was utter shit. But uh, and then, of course, they, what about good old Two Face? They just bypass him completely in the merchandising. Um, Joel mentioned about Batman Returns being a good atmospheric. Uh, well, the movie was like that, so it was good that they could carry that over. Uh, and Jared may mention of the Batman glasses from Macca's. Uh, yeah, I have them as well. And one of the reasons why they're actually quite rare and quite important to get is because they were made in France. And, of course, good old, good old French weren't exactly the most popular people in the universe after all their nuclear testing in the early 90s. <laughs> oh, they shit out of everything. So, uh, yes, I didn't know if you knew that, but they came from France. So, uh, yes, very, very cool. There you go. So we come to the next one. We've got a riddle for you. So we're not talking Star Wars with this. Um, but riddle me this, which movie franchise has spawned the most games? So we're not talking Star Wars. Take Star Wars out of the equation. I'll waffle on for a couple of seconds so the <coughs> comments can catch up. Does anyone want to hazard a guess what it is? It is quite a, a big movie franchise that stretches us back. It's got, like, quite a lot of movies in this franchise. No, um, you're just dangling too many carrots, mate. You're making it too easy. I'll tell you what it is, and it's not Dune. <laughs> That's for sure. It's definitely <laughs> not Last Starfighter. So uh, there you go. Oh, it's a good guess from Ange. Good old Star Trek. Whoosh. Yeah. Did you watch our episode last week, Star Trek, on about Star Trek Ange? Because obviously a lot, of, a lot of people didn't. <laughs> yeah. But we've got we've got Joe there that's actually actually got it with Bond. Yes, he has. Good old Bond. And we're not talking about Bond, the, the four ladies who play violins either. So we're talking about the other Bond. So there you go. And Jeffro's got it. Joel's got it. There you go. Um, so, yes, exactly right. It is. So dang, I, dang, I, dang, 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 dang. Yep, there we go. I, I knew there were a few James Bond games, but I did not realise there was as many as there actually were. And there's been some fantastic ones and there's been some absolute stinkers as well. So we're not going to look at every single one, but we're going to go through um, a few of them and um, we'll have a, a brief look at all the other ones in between. So that's all of them uh, lined up except for one. There was two different View to a Kill games. Yeah, sorry, Angel. I was just being facetious, mate. I wasn't having a go. So, uh, yeah, it's all very, very cool. Uh, Thomas said Final Fantasy. That's interesting because Final Fantasy did eventually become a movie and it bankrupted its studio in the process. But, hey, let's not worry about that. We're on to Bond. Look at that. So these are the first couple of Bond games. Um, 83 was the first one and it was on the Atari and a couple of other systems. And, again, it was one of those games when you look at the graphics, you go, that could be anything. There's no way you would know that was James Bond. Um, interestingly, though, we were talking about graphic uh, adventures and two of the early James Bond ones were the you type in um, adventures, but they had no graphics at all. And I remember I had a couple of games like that. I never had the James Bond ones. And if they weren't good, as in if they weren't well, well written, you usually gave them up after about two pages. Um, I never saw either of the James Bond ones, so I can't comment on them. But they are quite dry um, just reading and, like, oh typing stuff in and trying to work your way through the, the storyline. I guess with the James Bond movies, you already have an idea of the storyline and where it's got to go, so they might be a little bit easier. The other one down there is... Hang on. I was just going to catch off because I thought... I, I didn't know if this was a spelling error or not, and it turns out it is a spelling error, but this is how it was presented to me first, right? The first one is called Stirred and Not Shanked. <laughs> I thought... <laughs> Hang on, did he make a spelling error? I thought, no, no, he knows his shit. He's going to, that's, that's actually what it's called, right? And then he realised, shake and not stirred. But I'm going to go with that one. Stirred and not shanked. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when you shank me, baby. <laughs> yeah. So there's, as you can see, there was two versions of View to a Kill that came out to support the movie. And the, the other one I actually had, and um, you could see down the bottom, I don't know if you remember the scene, there's the town hall burning down and a game screen would burn one at a time and you had to work your way out of it. I remember it being quite a frustrating and disappointing game and didn't play it very much. Very good. Now, Daniel has mentioned about the worst license. We're going to get to that. So uh, we've probably got the one that everybody knows about, but don't write it down yet. So uh, just sit tight, kitties. And here we go through the ages. We're not going to look at every single one of these, but there was The Living Daylights, uh, Live and Let Die, which was actually quite a good one. You, uh, It came out years after the original Live and Let Die, but you were... Uh, uh, riding a speed bike through the bios, and it is quite a fun game, uh, doing jumps and finding villains and shooting stuff. There was License to Kill. There was The Spy Who Loved Me, which was actually a rip-off of um, Spy Hunter. It was almost exactly the same game, except they branded it James Bond. Um, 
there was the Stealth Affair, which um, I never played, and then there was James Bond Jr., which, again, when, when you're a kid and you're seeing James Bond Jr. and you're sort of a bit older, you think that's a bit lame, so you avoid it. James Bond the Jewel, I'd never played that. And then there's we've skipped number 12 because there is one we have to speak about a bit more. Um, people will probably know what that is. And then there's the, the James Bond on the Game Boy, which I never had a Game Boy, so I never, ever, ever played. Um, if we skip through to the next one. Starts getting a bit more modern. I didn't really want to do too much modern stuff, but I thought as we're going to do all the James Bonds, I'll go through them quickly. We come through to Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, 007 Racing, um, which is one I, ne I never had, um, Agent Under Fire, which when you're getting to this point, that almost sounds like a Police Academy movie, you know, Citizens Under Siege, Agent Under Fire. I think they're really pushing it by this point. Um, Night Fire, Everything or Nothing, uh, Golden Eye, Rogue Agent, and then From Russia with Love. And I, I remember getting this after a couple of really ga uh, a, a really average games. Um, they had a really good one. From Russia with Love was quite a good um, James Bond game. Very good. And then uh, Bloodstone, which was uh, pretty big, Quantum of Solace, and GoldenEye 007. And it's interesting, that was 2010, and the rights for James Bond have been up in the air, and there hasn't been a James Bond game since then. But the one we're going to look at, and this is one of my favourite games of all, all time, and I'm sure a lot of people who have played first-person shooters will remember the original Nintendo GoldenEye, which um, ends up on a lot of people's favourite games or best games ever produced. It was such a good game that there was they released the Nintendo in a GoldenEye-themed box, which is quite rare, and anyone who played it, one of the most exciting things, you will see the picture at the top middle there of the four screens and it'll instantly take you back. It had four player mode and it actually run quite smoothly and four of your friends could come over and you could run around this amazing map and you would just like creep up behind them and shoot them. It was the most fun. Uh, did you ever play this, Dags? Actually, I did. It's very funny because we were talking about the controller earlier, and that was the thing I couldn't stand about Nintendo was the controller. It was an absolute pain in the ass. But back in the 90s, I had a friend of mine. He had a Nintendo. He had GoldenEye, and he had four controllers, and he came over one night, uh, so him and his missus and my and my missus at the time, and he said he was just plugging it all into the TV. And I thought, well, if it's like a computer game, it'll take him like four and a half hours to sort of like get the video card working and the sound card working and all sort of crap. I go into the kitchen you know, get a drink, I come back out, and there it is. It's all set up, ready to go with four players. And that was my yeah. first introduction into that, into one console playing and two multi playing with consoles on one screen. And it was like revolutionary as far as I was concerned. And I thought after that, who needs a computer ever again? It was absolutely magnificent. So, yes, I did actually experience this. It was, and as you said, it was absolutely an awesome lot of fun. I think it, we spent it, hours playing this. Great. It was a game changer. And I think the thing it did, a lot of games after that, that sort of already existed, they then started putting multiplayer uh, levels in or, or modes where you could fight each other. And that was a lot of fun. And I do think a lot of other games did it pretty well. But because James Bond did it first and did it so well, it was a revolutionary game. It is one of the, the best games ever created, I think. Um, so, yeah, you're right, Jared. Sometimes it was hard to look at other not look at other screens because TVs were only a certain size back then and you're like you're taking up a quarter and you're just seeing movement on the side. Even when I used to play um, uh, console games Halo and Call of Duty at a friend's place on a big projector screen, uh, I mean, you can even off the corner of your eye, you can still see different colours and different environments, even if you did try not to look so you couldn't kind of help yourself. But uh, um, did they make an octopusy game? I think that is enough. No, I don't. I don't think they. I don't think they did. Uh, they did go back and make a lot of different games, and some of the Bond games, um, <clears throat> like the For Russia with Love one, had a lot of different villains in. And you could also play. I think Odd Job in um, Golden Eye was one of my favourites, and you could you could fight and play old villains. But I don't remember them doing an octopusy game. No. Yeah, and yeah, Rumble Pack's about having the controller move and all the rest of that came much later, I think. So there you go. Mm -hmm. So from the greatest game in the entire universe, we now look on probably one of the worst, if not the worst, or most certainly most unsuccessful game in the entire planet. What was it, Mister uh, Mister uh, Aaron? Well, you don't even need a drum hole, a, dr a drum hole. You don't even need a drum roll for this. There's no one to phone home to because it's ET. <laughs> And to think we're all stuck at home, except for you uh, at the moment, uh, in isolation. <laughs> How ironic is that? So I don't know truly if this is the worst game ever, 
but for something that was hyped so much and sold so well on such a good movie, it's got to be one of the most disappointing games of all time. I have met people who said they liked TT and they thought it was a fun game, but for every one of them, there's 200 people that wanted to throw the cartridge out the window and never, ever see it again. I had ET growing up. And as far as I remember, I played it about three times because I would be walking along and then I would fall down a hole that I couldn't get out of and then I would die and the game would end. Um, there, This is legendary in that it sold massively on pre-order for Christmas and then it was one of the most returned games ever within January when people were like, it's broken, it doesn't work, we can't get it to play. And there's documentaries on this and they were under such time pressure to produce it and get it out and get it ready for Christmas, that it really wasn't ready to go. It, even the people who wrote it were embarrassed by it. And there was some, so at the time, there were some really good programmers on it. And even um, Steven Spielberg went into Atari and there's, um, it, it's it's like not even an urban legend. He did it and he, he played it and he said, oh, I want it to be more like this and more like this and gave them advice and they tried to do it. And it was still a crap disappointing game and it must be the only game which has a documentary on how it was all sent to the dump and people ex excavated it years later because again it was an urban legend apparently in the middle of the night atari loaded all of their surplus games um into dump trucks or into um hired trucks and they drove them out into the Mexican desert, I think, and just uh, dumped them all in landfill and filled them in. And there was all these um, stories of the, the villagers going, well, we saw them and we saw they were Atari cartridges and it became an urban legend. And there is actually a documentary where a guy said, well, we're going to see if it was real or if it was a legend. Went back to the people uh, in Mexico or New Mexico who thought they remembered where they were and they actually dug up the tip of the landfill and they actually found the cartridges, so it was true. Now, here's one of those crazy, crazy things that is mad about collectors. You can buy a mint copy of Atari ET for so much, but if you can find one on eBay that's been dug out of the, the dump, it goes for more than a mint copy because of the whole story behind it. So it's one of those things where a... You, you take it's like Belloc. You take a watch, you put it in the ground, <laughs> and you dig it up, and it's priceless. They took the cartridges that were crap, they buried them in the ground, and someone dug them up, and now they're worth more because of the whole mystique and story behind them. Yeah, Joel's actually got one from the desert, uh, apparently. And if you're wondering, it did actually have some vocal commands. So you see that little ET in the corner there, and he just says one word in the entire game crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, it, is, it is interesting, it's maybe art, um, you know, I guess, predicting life where the game was, E.T. falls into a hole <laughs> and, and gets sort of trapped in the hole and then all the E.T. cartridges got put in a hole and buried as well. So um, I, I like this one from Dave. Yeah, they call him Belosh. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> That's that guy there that we're looking at with the hat. Uh, yeah, so good old E.T. Uh, yes, way, uh, a story about, about what could have been so... Um, and the thing is, because it was, it's got this story associated with it. That'll go on for history. It'll long before, it after the movie's long forgotten and everything else. People who are in the gaming industry will always remember ET. So the fact that it had such a disastrous sort of life means that it's going to become legendary now, and it'll probably, you know, stories will be, songs will be sung about it by minstrels in decades from now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, um, I'm sure there's more documentaries that are going to be made on gaming, and ET is always going to come up as one of those legendary bad games. Like I said, I do not know if that was the worst game ever because when I was a kid, I'd play stuff and go, "This is absolute crap," and never play it again. But I think it was mainly because not a lot happened. It was very buggy. It just it just didn't play well at all. So in terms of actually playing quality, if they had to fix it and release it properly, it may have been okay. But, uh, yeah, it's yeah. one of those great stories. Now, it's actually just after 9.30 here. We've only got a handful of slides left to go, so we're, we're going to keep going. We're all stuck down in lockdown anyway. We can't go anywhere, so we'll plow on. Let's plow. So that was the last sort of game we were looking at. But this is one of those interesting things where the movies – would have originally had toys, but then the games are so well loved for some of these franchises that NECA, who releases a lot of these um, action figures, have actually released the game series, uh, the classic video game series of action figures. So a lot of people love their action figures to be like screen accurate and amazing, but 
these have proven really popular where you get a bright purple Batman because that's what he looked like in the Batman movie or you get a Jason with a, a blue mask and a purple jumpsuit on. Um, I've got to jump in here. This is regarding the ET game. The Vial has said something absolutely fantastic. Couldn't you just buy a mint game, ET game, let the dog play with it in the backyard, then sell it on? So you can just imagine, right? You say, oh, look, I've got a rare a Mexican dug up ET game. And you look at the bite marks and they're from a Shih Tzu or something and you go, <laughs> those dogs even exist in Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> you see, you can always see the theme with the viol. He always wants to violate stuff. He wants to take a nice mint game and violate it. Yeah, so. it's like, don't get the dog to chew it. Chew it yourself, dude. I'd pay a buck for that. <laughs> anyway, keep that coming. Is, that is the thing. I guess it is one of those things where if you were someone, you go, well, hold, why don't I just wreck my game and say it was one dug up in the desert? I guess you just can't know, can you? Yeah, um, yeah. It's like That's people who buy pieces of the Berlin Wall. How do you know it's a piece of the Berlin Wall and not just an old piece of concrete that someone's selling? I don't know. If the if the vial was to violate a, an ET game by munching into it himself, <laughs> I'd be happy to pay money for that. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> yeah. So here we have the, the NECA range of um, classic video game figures, and it's a really broad range of different stuff, and that's because NECA already holds the rights to a lot of these franchises. So they probably just go through and go, do you know what? If we, um, we've we got all the, the moulds, we can just put green in, in uh, Leatherface and say he's from the video game and everyone will go and buy it again. But what I have found, there are people who don't collect action figures in general, but they love gaming so much and these resonate with their childhood so much that they will go, oh my goodness, it's Batman from the game I used to play and they will collect, collect it. Um, and it's the same with me where I go, who would buy this? And then I go, oh, wow, this, they brought this out from this game. I never thought they would do that. And I'm the one who ends up buying it. So nostalgia has a, a strong pull on some people, doesn't it? Very good. Even though we've been going for an hour and a half, some people out there might be thinking, geez, I could really go to the can and have a wee. Well, don't worry about that because we've got that right here. <laughs> here we go. And this is the future. Well, we didn't go really into this tonight and we might in the future lego uh, have done a really amazing well it's not lego it's traveler's tales the company have done a really amazing job of taking um franchises and legoizing it and making really good games and these are probably the last games i really got into because my when my son was growing up he was too young to really play games but he wanted to play so he would sit on my lap with a controller that wasn't hooked in and then i would play and he think he was playing so um, I think the last game I ever 100% completed was the first um, Lego Indiana Jones game. Now, down the track, we might look at the Lego games, but there are so many of them, we haven't got the time now. But um, there's some of the Lego games from some of the big franchises that have been around. Um, interesting question from Christy Labyrinth. I assume she's asking if there was a Labyrinth game. I'm assuming there wasn't. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure there was. I I don't remember it. Um, when I looked tonight, I didn't see it. But uh, it's one of those things I'll have to look up. It was one of those things researching this, where there are so many games. When we look at the first slide, there's games from everything from like Home Alone and there's Evil Dead, which I didn't uh, get time to use and stuff like that. And I didn't even touch on the Disney stuff because um, a lot of the Disney movies have been made into different games that have, some of them have been very successful. But that's like a whole episode by itself. Pretty much though, any movie that sort of got a moderate release, someone would get the franchise and do a game of it. Yeah, Joel answered a question earlier. I didn't get a chance to put the screen up, uh, whether there was an octopusy game. And he said, uh, there's an octopusy, ad, uh, say, I don't know what that means, adventure game. So it was like octopusy did get some um, work after all, which is kind of cool. Uh, literally played like so. I'm just having a look at some of that. <laughs> Do I like Batman Lego? No, not particular. I'm not much of a Lego person to be honest with you. Um, but uh, Lego is obviously very, very popular, and uh, there's no denying that, uh, which is a very, very groovy. So, and Joel played with the Lego Star Wars Luke and Zelda. Uh, Zelda was his daughter, by the way, not <laughs> in case you're wondering. So, very good stuff. Uh, and that actually brings us, believe it or not, to the end of the presentation. How exciting is that, everybody? Very cool. What do you reckon? Thanks for being with us tonight. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I look, look, look back where games looked a, a lot less refined than they do now. Um, it's very funny, Daniel, talking about games that turned into movies. We covered that off actually in Sci-Fi Zone a couple of years ago, funnily enough. So, uh, yes, there are a good, some good examples. And, of course, there are a lot of examples of, that, of games that don't translate very well into movies at all. Uh, there are some that do, but it'll plan that don't. But uh, That'll ship. Yes. 
Uh, very good. Uh, good stuff. Very, very cool. Uh, is there anything else you want to add in before we get ready to shuff off, Mr. No, Aaron? Got no, um, got no questions. Um, I think we've, we've, we've gamed out. Very good stuff. So next week we're talking about Star Wars games. Is that correct? That's right. So if anyone was um, thinking we missed Star Wars tonight and they didn't see the beginning of the presentation, there's so many Star Wars games, you can't really do them with other stuff. So next week is a Star Wars episode. We're just going to be looking at Star Wars gaming and, and see how many of those we can go through and reminisce about. Very good. And if you do happen to dig up your ET Atari game from uh, somewhere in the Mexican, de make Mexican desert, make sure you remember to keep it mint in box. Or if you have got one that's mint in box and you feel like playing it, make sure you rip it out of the card. No, don't do that. Okay, see you guys. Bye. See you guys.